Suicide Prevention Show, where we are waking up the world and we're about to go into a place that many people have never contemplated. Thank goodness. Because we're going to go into what really, really creates prisoners. And what really is the definition of a prisoner. And as it says, you, what's the definition of a jail? And to take us on that journey, I'd like for you to help me welcome to the studio, Rocky. Rocky, join us. Turn on your camera. Let's have, let's go for this. Hello, Ms. Jackie. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Yay. Yay. Ooh, I like your flowers. Do what you love. Yes, yes. All, All right, so you. what do you love right now? Before we get into anything heavy and deep diving, what do you love? I, and I'm thinking about right now, I love my morning routine. I wake up early, I do a little meditation, I relax, I sit down, I go to the gym, I clean up, um, I kind of just focus on what I'm about to do for the day and slowly get into my work a little bit, answer some emails, and I, I love it. I love having my early mornings, and they really, uh, you know, get me started on the right foot every day. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, we're gonna talk about jail. We're gonna talk about prison. We're gonna talk about all of these things because you have a very unique perspective. So why don't you give some story, introduce people to who you are and how you came to be talking about this. Definitely. Um, so my name is Rocky Singh Candola. Um, I'm 35 years old. I currently live in Los Angeles. I was born in New York City. Uh, my parents are first generation directly from India. Um, so jumping right into what you're speaking about, um, quote unquote, jail and prisons and institutions for me started at a very young age. Um, starting from 11 years old, I started going to institutions and boot camps or gulag schools, they call them, all across the world from Mexico to Canada. Um, places that are now shut down from you know child abuse, rape, torture, um, and all kind of stuff like that, um, that are actually still in operation. So from a young age, uh, 11 to about 17, 18, that was uh, my life. Um, a lot of it was in survival mode, flight or flight mode. Wait a minute, hold it. You got to slow this down a little bit. A gulag school? That's like a, a name for them, like what they kind of call them. Um, if you, the, the actual name for the ones I went to were called the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs, um, where basically, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that sounds pretty you know, positive. The Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs. Exactly. And they, they work very hard to make them sound and look, you know, pretty positive. Um, and, you know, a lot of them have been uncovered recently with Paris Hilton doing a big documentary called This is Paris, um, you know, where she went to one of those schools as well in the U.S. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, anything could be further from the truth. You know, they're uh, very abusive and very manipulative, uh, both to the parents that are looking to just, you know, help their child out and not sure where to turn, feeling overwhelmed, and obviously as well as the children who go through them. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions about this, Rocky, if you don't mind, because what would prompt a parent to go looking for a specialty school? Um, you know, from a personal stance, my father was just starting a practice, you know, in Mississippi, uh, new to the country as well. Um, and, you know, from what they're used to in India, they're used to very um, mindful kids, kids that listen and study and go home and respect their elders. And I was uh, a bit of a wilder child. I was very outspoken, very talkative, very, very hyper. I always wanted to be out and about. Um, and they just didn't know how to deal with me. And then my two twin brothers and sisters. Um, and you know, I was kind of the, the black sheep that they didn't, they couldn't control, couldn't handle. Um, so I think it was kind of an innocent thing. He just started looking in the back of newspaper ads and finally saw one that said, hey, do you want to reclaim your child and bring love back into your family? Um, and him being, you know, a high functioning, a doctor and wanting to handle the issue quickly, he just kind of called. Uh, I'm not really sure how much research he did, but he, he just went from there and feeling overwhelmed and signed me up and off I went. <laughs> so you went into a program to, that from your dad's point of view was to help reclaim you into the family with love. Exactly. What happened? Um, so I went to the same program twice, actually. The first time I was 11 or 12. The second time I was about 17. Um, the second time I was actually like basically kidnapped out of my bed with my ankles cuffed and my hands cuffed um, and escorted by these two guys that were so tall that they had to turn off my fan in the bedroom. 
in order for them to like stand over me. Um, the first time I was told that I was going to be going to like a nice summer camp, I'll spend some time there and they were going to help me. And there was like jet skis and pools and this and that. And my mother actually flew with me to San Diego um, and dropped me off there. And um, we drove down to Ensenada. And as soon as we got there, there was this big four walls, a red building. And uh, you get in and everything seems okay enough. But as soon as you get to the point where you leave your mother and you go to the next door, um, everything changes. The hallways get dirty, the lights get dark. They start screaming at you and pushing you, ripping your clothes off, cutting your hair, um, cursing at you and telling you, we don't know how long you're gonna be here. We're gonna be here for a very long time. Um, you know, so get used to it. And uh, it just gets, uh, from the second you walk past those doors, you're like, you're in shock. You're, you're, you, you sleep on the hallway for 10 days. You're woken up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. to do a head count in the rain. Um, there's no communication with the outside world, nor with your peers inside. Everything's very strict and regimented um, and kind of built around a brainwashing type of mentality, um, as well as, you know, obviously physically, sexually, and mentally abusive um, staff. Wow, how long were you in that environment being totally cut off from your parents? The first time I was there for seven months and the second time at 17, I was there for roughly the same time. So for seven months, your parents had no contact with you? Uh, exactly, we were allowed to write letters uh, once a week and receive letters from our parents only. However, they were you know, severely redacted. If we said anything um, you know, negative or manipulative as they seemed you know, about the program, about what was happening, they would give it back to us and tell us to rewrite it. Um, you know, phone calls could be earned at a certain time and stage, and I never got to that level um, because you know it's a business, it's a for-profit business. If if the children are getting out too fast, uh, they're not going to make any money. So the only way to get out was either to be graduate the program, which they don't tell you how long it takes, to be pulled out by your parents, or to wait until you're 18, and then at 18 you get put on the border of the U.S. and Mexico with fifty dollars and a bus ticket. What? That was the that was their um that we we were taught that since day one, um and that's the that's the program. Okay, so the good news is you said these domes were shut down. Well, no, um, there's many of them still in existence. The, the program in particular I went to WWASP has the ownership. A lot of them still work uh, in the industry, uh, but they've changed names and reopened different areas. Um, in fact, I had the chance to visit the one. Um, that I went to as a kid in Mexico and actually paid a guard to walk through. I made a YouTube video about like walking through and so many of the brothers and sisters I went there with like, wow, man, thank you. Like my nightmares are so much worse. I'm so glad it's closed. However, as we're talking now, I've, I've, I've learned that there's another one open about an hour and a half away from that school. So they're continuously popping up again and again. Okay, so this is a case of parents beware. Watch out for the promises and anything that prevents you from having contact with your kids. So, oh my God, so when you came out of that program, um, what happened next for you? Um, so I was about 12 or 13. And uh, when I came out, the school I was in before, um, you know, all my friends, you know, from, you know, grade school growing up, I was sent uh, automatically to a quote unquote like high class a uh, private school uh, about 30 minutes away from my home. My, fa my father bought a home there uh, in order for us to all go to this private school. And, you know, I, me just coming out of this situation I was in, um, most of the kids there, you know, had issues with drugs and, and gangs and violence and um, were quite a bit older than me. I was one of the youngest ones there. So to be going from that and to put into like this type of school all of a sudden, and then these people already knew my story because they heard me on the on the roll call for a, a six months while I didn't show up because I was in the school. They were like, oh, Rocky is that kid that stole his parents' car and got sent to Mexico and now he's in school with us. So I already had this kind of build up there. Um, and that, you know, time there, I was kicked out of that school maybe six months later um, after a kid, you know, said something mean to me and I uh, kind of threatened him back. And, um, you know, that was kind of my reaction at that time. If someone tries to bother me or, or hurt me, I felt like, I would have to lash back very quickly. Otherwise, I'll be seen as someone that could be hurt and taken advantage of. Um, so getting kicked out of there just kind of spiraled into me going from there to military school um, and then to another facility and then back to um, a Catholic boarding school then to public school. And then when I was in the public school, back in my hometown where we, I started, um, I quickly kind of fell into the crowd of like partying and drinking, um, you know, at 17 years old. And on the way back from spring break one year, I uh, got pulled over by the police 
Um, I wasn't driving, but we had alcohol in the car and got charged with minors in possession of alcohol. And uh, a week or so later, I came home late one night. I saw my father on the couch. I already knew that like what could happen to me to, me to get sent to these schools. He was already upset with me. So I would, I closed my door. I put my desk in front of my door, put my dog in my room, kept like a hammer and knife under my bed and I was scared to sleep. But um, somehow they opened the door without me hearing it, got my dog out and woke me up with my hands and my feet cuffed. And I was headed back to the same facility or a different facility by the same program with actually the same owners who kind of like, when I was there the first time, he like basically beat me up, kicked me down the hallway and tied my hands and feet behind my back for one, two, three, four, I don't even know how many days it was, but I laid on the ground and had nothing but orange juice and rice twice a day. And I was heading back there and I was on the border of Canada and New York in Ogdensburg. Holy Toledo. Your parents had no clue about what was going on at this school. They didn't. I remember when I first got out, I tried to tell them a little bit and I told them like, um, you know, what happened and, you know, the, the sexual stuff, the physical stuff. And they were kind of like, a little bit skeptical of it. You know, at this point in time, the schools have told them that your kids are going to manipulate you. They're going to lie to you. Um, so don't believe anything they say. Wow. Okay. So this is really a professional brainwashing program. They didn't only brainwash you, they brainwashed your parents. Exactly. Exactly. So this is, this is like, holy crap, Rocky. I had no idea that when we were talking about prison and jails, you weren't kidding. You didn't have to be in jail. I mean, you were a kid. You weren't in jail. You were sent to school for parents trying to reclaim you into the family with love. Holy crap. All right. So now you're out of this program. You've graduated. You turned 18, apparently. 17. My parents pulled me out at, when I was 17 after I had graduated high school from there with a fake diploma because the school wasn't accredited to even take out diplomas. So I had a fake diploma. All right. So you're, you're almost a high school graduate and you're back home. What happened next? So I got accepted into the, the local university, University of South Alabama, um, and started college right away. And, you know, when I got out, I kind of I had a, a pretty big chip on my shoulder. I was I was an adult now. Um, you couldn't tell me anything, authority, nothing at all. Um, I dove headfirst into a lifestyle of partying, doing drugs, selling drugs, women, um, violence, you know, towards me and towards others. Um, just a crazy, crazy lifestyle that, you know, only lasted for a, a short couple of years until I was finally arrested for, you know, big charges. And in between there, I, I got arrested multiple times for possession of drugs and, and, and drinking and, and, and being out and things of that nature um, until finally I was arrested for distribution of controlled substances uh, with an undercover sting operation uh, by the federal government, the state government, the local government working together. Um, and that that started my, my time into actual real, they call it big boy jail or prison. Oh boy, you know, a whole language that most of us don't know anything about, big boy jail. Yeah, so. What you've got going on in your life now is so dramatically different from this story. What turned it around for you? So after I got out of prison, um, I was still really kind of in the same mindset a lot. I, I dove right back into the whole lifestyle. Uh, I'm not the type of person that you can like scare or punish or hit anymore to make me change. It has to come from within. Um, and that finally came uh, one day in the form of Definitely a higher power, definitely a higher energy. Um, but also my father asking me, you know, hey Rocky, um, you know, I was assaulted and had all my teeth taken out of my jaw, crushed, and I had finally got my teeth back at this point in time. Um, and I also I was done my probation, my after prison care, uh, or after prison, <laughs> I wouldn't say care, whatever you want to call it, probation. Um, but he said, hey, you know, you're not home anymore. You're not, you know, living here. We don't know what you're doing, but how about, you know, maybe going somewhere else, getting away from all this and I'll pay for you to leave the country. You know, you can go wherever you want to go. And at that point in time, again, you know, I had thought I was smarter. I was, uh, had a circle of different people where I was selling things in. I was, you know, doing, I was actually addicted to opiates at the time. Um, and I had girlfriends and cars and a little bit of money. And I decided um, I want something different. I want something else. And I don't know what I'm going to do or how it's going to look, but I'm letting go of all this. So I let go of all of it and left the country. 
So your dad gave you a question. How about if you walk away from all this? And he wasn't even sure, I don't think, at that time what he was asking me. He was just, I guess he had an intuition. And that's why I say it's a higher power that was acting through him and acting for both of us. And it allowed me to make that decision. That was November 4th, 2013, when I finally decided that. Wow. So November 4th, 2014, where did you go? I went to India. Um, I went to India and I lived with a family friend on a farm and just started living a clean life. Um, just helping him out on his farm, working out on a daily basis. I didn't have, you know, marijuana, cigarettes. Um, I didn't really couldn't communicate with any of my friends much anymore because there was no, not much service there and signal there. Um, and I slowly let go of just all these identities and attachments I had, um, you know, built up of, you know, party animal, dope boy, playboy, this and that. And um, <clears throat> that kind of just slowly came in me as that time in India kind of progressed and progressed. How long did you live on the farm in India? Um, so my life has a pattern of like six or seven months at a time everywhere I go. So I was here for like six or seven months um, before I actually found my now um, ex-wife um, who, you know, actually greatly helped me like in my mindset and in my heart kind of move on to a different place in my life. Um, met her and then that's a whole story that starts from there as well. <laughs> um, but I left, we, we left together and came back to the U.S. Um, and, and moved to New Jersey uh, where I didn't really know anybody hardly. And uh, got married there, and I started working, teaching tennis, uh, and eventually, you know, started the business there as well. Wow! All right. So even your marriage, okay. So, so you said now ex-wife, okay. So so, and did your marriage last longer than seven months? I'm curious. Barely, about <laughs> about a year and a half, about fifteen to eighteen months, and then we split up, and then we tried it again um, for about a year, year and a half, and then we split up. That was about three years ago almost now that we, you know, split up uh, for the last time. Cool. And it, and it sounds like it was um, not dramatic. It was not working out. It was quite dramatic, actually. Oh, uh -huh. there we go. That's why I checked my assumption. <laughs> it was quite dramatic. Um, I, I was still um, just getting out of this lifestyle. I was just, I, I made a promise to myself, like, I'm not going back to selling drugs. And I never did. And I never have. Um, however, I was still using quite a bit of marijuana, um, pills here and there, and drinking, you know, overly as well, um, which definitely added to the problems we had in our relationship. I think communication was a big thing. Um, I have a lot of fear and trust issues myself from my childhood time, um, and that def definitely didn't help the relationship at all. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it, we just really were not as compatible um, as we originally thought we were in our honeymoon phase, basically. Um, and once again, like she's a great person. She has her own problems and issues, just like we all do. Um, and we've, you know, since then, you know, talked about most of them and apologized to each other on multiple levels. Um, but, you know, as uh, when we're going through these type of things, uh, we can't see the, the bigger picture. We can't see the end of the tunnel sometimes. Um, so going through is very tough. After all I've been through, it was still um, even like almost dying in surgeries and, and prisons and jails and kid boot camps. This was one of the toughest things I've, I've dealt with um, going through that time when we were actually separating and going through the, the proceedings and, and leaving each other. Wow. It's interesting. I keep coming back to this thought that, yeah, you weren't in prison, but you were still in jail um, from the, because I can see where trust would be a challenge when you had the experience that you had of, of your parents trusting an organization. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, since you said that to me about, you know, you don't have to be a prisoner to be in jail, it's, it's, it's actually helped me and played my mind so much because I realize it now. And, and when we become aware about things, I think that's when we can actually start to change it. Um, and it, it, it's so true because I remember sometimes in prison, um, sitting in prison, that I felt more free than I did in some of the recent years of my life when I was going through different problems. And we can create those in our mind. And when we're stuck in those mindsets and those patterns, we are in a, in a huge sense of the word in jail, in prison, um, and we can stop ourselves and stop our lives from doing anything that we want to do or anything that we are meant to do while we're there. Yeah. When I first came up with the concept of invisible jails, it was about one of my clients who struggled with dramatic and traumatic PTSD. And he, they, they actually were hijacked 
is how they described it. I mean, he was standing on his front porch and all of a sudden with no external trigger whatsoever, he was transported back to a very traumatic memory of when he was 11 years old. That's an age that's very pivotal, very pivotal for kids. And his was you know, something that happened. I mean, it was a car accident. But his experience of it with his family and what, you know, the, the ambulance rides and all of the pain and the, the experience going forward in his life and in his family's life from the injuries of that, all of a sudden could capture him. And, and he was just like not present to the present world at all and dealing with it all over again, which is my definition of PTSD, is when you're literally reliving the emotional experience. For you, you know, he he was 50 years in an invisible jail. That's how I ended up telling his story. For you, you had time in a brick and mortar prison and you know, lots of little things. You also had the experience of being in that school, this physical environment. You know, those are prisons of a type. But then you had all of these experiences in between where you were in jail hijacked by your own <laughs> and so well you're figuring out how to silence the alarms and then I'm not oh, scared. I don't know why it's not. <laughs> it happens I mean we welcome to live shows so what did what happened that you finally gave yourself or what happened you went because going to India itself was not enough to get you out of jail no, and I mean, um, I guess some, they say some people learn through like listening to experiences of others, um, and some people have to kind of learn it themselves. Um, and at that point, when I had went to India, I made some changes and got rid of distractions in my life, um, and did what didn't serve me. I wasn't really doing it as consciously and as as like as aware with awareness. Um, when she left the first time, and we were in California together, uh, my ex-wife. Um, I was kind of left homeless. I was in a California, I was living in a minivan because we were with her parents and I had nowhere to go. Um, and I had already experienced like what my business could do in California. And all my family and friends said, Rocky, come home, go home. Like, you know, you'll be safe at home, just come back. And something in me said, no, um, I have to try. I, if I go back home, I, I kind of felt like I knew what I would have done, especially in that mindset. I would have went right back to everything. And I hadn't came as far as I'd like, but I came far enough to realize that there is something different out there. Um, so I just kept trying and I stuck with it. And um, I went to a very low place uh, in California. I didn't get back into selling drugs, but I was definitely drinking and, and ending up in Hollywood restrooms randomly in the middle of the night, um, you know, doing cocaine and different stuff like that. Until finally, um, I just kind of stopped. I, I wasn't able to get a house. I would have a, a, no bank history, no work history not much of um, you know, any credit and I'm a convicted felon. So no one gave me a place to live. Um, and finally, this one place downtown LA that I didn't even look at, they, they said, okay, if you have X amount of dollars, we can let you live here. I moved into that place and I was working on business the whole time. But when I moved in, I finally said, you know what? This is Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, um, I believe 2000, maybe 16 or 17. And I quit eating meat. I uh, stopped drinking. I stopped smoking uh, for quite a bit of time. And I started getting into meditation and yoga and, and these kind of practices um, that kind of uh, kind of clear the mind, mind and, and realign the body and the soul. And it came in the form of one of my friends from childhood that came to live with me for a while. He flew in from Korea and he didn't try to teach me anything or show me anything. He just simply came with me and lived that clean lifestyle uh, next to me. And I saw it and I said, you know what, this is what I want. I want something like this. And that's when I started uh, really, really like changing my life. And, and really like I stopped listening to music. I stopped watching movies and television. I started consciously placing myself around people that were aligned with these things. And I started reading and watching YouTube videos like, you know, of, like of Ralph Smart, Joe Dispenza, Tony Robbins, uh, Alan Watts, you know, all these amazing men on, on YouTube. They kind of share their, their this knowledge for free. And man, that saved my life because I was so lost at that point in time. I didn't really know what to do. I thought I had, you know, done better. And then I had this big blow come to me again as an adult that was, you know, nothing on the outside did it to me. No, no parents grabbed me, no authority figures grabbed me. I, I kind of manifested that on my own. And I had to really 
sit back and look into myself and, and figure out what's going on and, and, and really change these things because I wanted that. I didn't want to go back to anything else. Okay. So you said something in there. I just want to unpack a little bit. You said no out externals. You said something happened, but no external force did it. So what was that that woke you up? What was the wake up happening? It was, it was just that, um, you know, the, the divorce or the, the ex-wife, the separation at that point in time, it, as an adult, you know, um, the things we get in our, ourselves into, you know, like we have to take responsibility for them. And for me at that point in time, like that feeling, like I, I said, wow, like Rocky, like you're not perfect. The other person's not perfect, but there are so many things that could have contributed, contributed to this that um, you could fix and you could not act like. And that kind of really woke me up at that point and said, I want something different. I want something better. And I've already tasted it. And now it's time to actually, you know, got consciously be aware, chase it and, and get to that point in that place. So chasing the clean lifestyle, not because somebody told you or took you into it, but because somebody showed you by living it themselves. Exactly. My, one of my best friends, he just, he just, he's a, he's a beautiful person man. good soul, like a light in my life. One of the few friends I still have left in my life. Um, that's always kind of been, you know, that energetic, good person. And as he's grown older, he's traveling and, and, and f fell more and more into this lifestyle of clean eating, clean living, good energy, uh, you know, gratitude, love. And he came and shared that with me um, without even, I don't even know if he meant to do so. He just, it was, I think intuitively for him, he knew like, Hey, my friend Rocky who I've, was friends with in childhood. I haven't spent much time with. Him. It sounds like he's, he needs someone strong to be there with him. And, he came and we helped each other and you know, I helped him start his smoothie business and he helped me just talking to me and living around me and, and you know, and, and showing me this lifestyle. And that was, you know, it was a much of a journey between there as well. I definitely had my, my steps, my slips and my steps backwards as well. Um, but, it, you know, it came together to the point of where I'm sitting right now and of having the morning routine that I discussed. And these are all small, small things that still help me every day. I still listen to these YouTube videos uh, constantly when I'm just working out or walking or feeling down or low. I just put on a positive uh, tape that allows me to just breathe and understand that I'm not alone in this, that um, there's plenty of help out there, whether I can find a mentor or a counselor or a coach or not, it's already out there. And um, all I have to do is be open to receiving it and listen to it a little bit. That's such an incredible journey, Rocky, that you have taken us on. What would you advise to somebody who is just starting out? They're, they're just at that point that you were that was, I'm ready for something different. Yeah, so I mean, that is the first point. Once you're ready, um, you have to trust and believe in the process because it will all unfold in front of you and it'll all be there. It's already within you. Once you, once you understand that and want that, um, I think the first step is getting rid of the distractions and the things that are no longer serving you and serving what you really want in your life and what you want to move forward to. For me, those things were friends, um, even to some extent family, um, and not because they were negative, because at that point in my life, it just wasn't serving me to, to listen to that, to that you know, kind of criticism and speech. Um, and then from there, the music I was uh, listening to, the, the movies I was watching, it was kind of like a full clearing of, of myself and my body. And then truly believing within me that there is something else out there. I, I do have goals and dreams and desires of, of wanting a better life and an amazing life. And that is possible no matter what situation I think I'm in, no matter where, what I've done, no matter what has happened, um, I can do that. And it's a slow process. You know, as I say, healing isn't linear. Um, this journey is not an easy one or, or you know, just a, a clear shot straight path by any means. Um, but it is a beautiful journey and it, you do learn and grow so much on the way. Um, and it's like, for me, I'm not even close to the end. I still feel like a, a child or a baby, like, you know, in this, in this life path and, and what I'm doing. And I'm constantly learning every day, but the difference is now, instead of uh, going to sleep to wake up the next party the next night, um, I go to sleep excited to know, like, I know tomorrow will bring problems. I know tomorrow will bring like amazing, uh, beautiful situations as well. And I'm excited to, to face all of them. So what are you doing now? You're, you're no longer partying, you're no longer dealing, you're no longer over there. What do you do now? So um, to rewind, when I was sitting in prison, I made a one page business plan, um, among oh. many other business plans. <laughs> really? <laughs> in my journal and that business plan, when I was in India, I actually had the chance to put it in effect. 
um, and it's a human hair extension company. Um, so while that's our meeting people and vendors and manufacturers and working and, and learning and marketing on Facebook at the same time. Um, so now, um, seven, eight, nine years later almost, I live in Los Angeles on the west side where I always wanted to live. I always talked about coming to California and living near the water. Um, the business is, is, you know, incredibly successful. We have a tight knit, you know, really amazing team of people that have also known me, uh, some of them since uh, younger ages and seen some of the things I went through from my jaw injury to my troubles and everything. Um, and we work hard and work amazingly and transparently for our clients and, and help other businesses all over the world, uh, you know, increase their business. Um, and recently now I've started writing my books about my past and bringing out my journals from prison and compiling them into one of my first books um, and having the opportunity and time now to speak about my story and share it. Because this story is something I was so ashamed to admit um, for the first years of my marriage and for the first years of my business and fears that it would bother my family and fears that I would lose clients and fears that people would look down on me if I spoke about it. Um, and when I started, I realized that my fears were totally uh, not true, that people found motivation and inspiration and what's happened to me and it all came together to make sense. So. so one more jail that you are no longer in. The jail of I can't tell my story because. That's a really powerful jail, Rocky, that so many people keep themselves locked into because they're afraid or they're a bit and and there's a lot of feeling of I'm ashamed of my story. And your ability to give yourself permission to come out of that jail. When was the first time that you told your story? So I remember when I first uh, was in downtown Los Angeles and opened my showroom <laughs> that Yelp did a big promotion thing and this big TV company came out to, um, to like interview me like for the business. And I, they asked me how the business start. And I had to lie and I don't like to lie, but I had to, because I, I couldn't say that I was in prison. I wrote this business plan there, especially on TV with my parents sitting right behind the camera and my ex, my ex wife sitting right there. So I was like, oh, you know, I was in India and I, I just kind of meditated upon it and that's why I was a guru. And I remember how dirty I felt you know, after that for a month or two. So I finally said, you know what, if I can't do this business and if I can't be honest and clear about it, then this is not for me. So I started with one, one client, one group of uh, girls and, and guys came in to speak with me. And um, about a week or two later, I said, so Rocky, you know, how'd you start the business? Like, well, how'd you do all this? And I took a breath and I was like, well, let me tell you the real story. And that was kind of the first time I actually gave like the real story right there. And when I, when I finished, and it was only maybe a five or 10 minute talk, like I kind of gave them the overviews of it. They were just like, what? Like, wow. like." Thank you for sharing that. That's so inspirational, motivational. Um, and from there, I was like, you know what? That's all. The, that's all the, the push I needed. That I'm not. I'm not saying anything else ever again about this story. I'm going to tell the truth, just like it was. And the people that, for some reason, don't want to look down on me, that is okay. Everyone's allowed to have their own opinions. They don't have to work with me. But I'm going to tell my truth. I'm going to tell my story, and I'm going to put it out there. And that was the okay. first time. So I'm. I'm just going to to. to put the, the, the linear pieces of this business together for, for myself. And you tell me if I've got it right, okay. You're in prison, another kind of prison, this time official prison. You're writing journals. You're, all of a sudden, you wrote a business plan? So we had a cell phone that would sneak in and we'd have to sit underneath the, the, the bunk beds and hide ourselves with towels and have people watch out for the correctional officers. And we would call like my bunk mates, uh, sisters and his cousins and ask them like, hey, tell us about, you know, this and this business and tell us about the pricing and the market and what people want, what people don't want. And that's how we I made the business plan. I still have that piece of paper. It's going on my book actually. Well, yeah, no kidding. Okay, so, so this is the, um, this is the, I'm gonna have a life when I get out of here. And you had to sneak to do that. That's going to be a whole nother conversation for somebody else's show, because I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But it, you're in a place where, on the surface, where you know, it's supposed to help you get prepared to reenter society. And yet, in the reality, you were having to be very sneaky 
about getting ready to have a life outside of that environment. Yeah, and once again, I mean, as we know, the recidivism rates in, in the U.S. are above 80 percent. Like those places are not geared to to reenter anybody's society. They're they're geared to to bring you back, actually. And I was, you know, blessed that I didn't fall back into it and go back. Well, you know, as a business model, having repeat business is a good plan. Um, however, for a prison system, having it's just like for an addiction system, having repeat business is actually failure of the organization. Um, and I say that with all due respect for all of these programs that are doing their best because there are some out there that really are geared to not have you come back. But this was not one of those. So you snuck and got enough information that you could write a one-page business plan. And now you're living that business plan. That is such an incredible story. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the book, uh, Robert Fulgham's book, you know, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Yes. And I'm like, okay, this is yours, Rocky. Everything I needed to know about business I learned in prison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, under the bunk bed stories could, could be a great, you know, <laughs> I'm like going, oh my God, how many of us? you know, did things that we snuck around and, and got information, but most of us were not putting really almost our lives on the line to do it, which is what it feels like to me, just listening to your story, that the reality of what would have happened to you if you had gotten caught. It would have been a lot of more, a lot more time. And I mean, Alabama state prisons are notorious for uh, beating inmates close to death and actually killing them. So it was definitely a life on the line situation for sure. Was. You know, this is just a little aside that we kind of got to, and I'm really glad that I asked and that you were willing to share that. Um, I, I have a great deal of respect for people who are willing to stand up and tell their story. And you have been doing that for several years now. What I'm just curious because there was a lot of trepidation around what will other people think and what will this do to my business? You know, I'll lose clients. Yeah, I heard you say that. And I'm like, all right, Rocky, what's happened to your business because you're willing to speak your truth? Literally 10x from the time I told you about sitting in that showroom in downtown to where I'm sitting right now, actually 10, 10x. Um, Finance-wise, team-wise, freedom-wise, um, just business and traffic-wise, everything. Um, it all came together. And people versus uh, being scared of me or you know, looking down upon me just respected the fact and loved the fact that here's an honest, transparent person that's actually doing good business. And, and we trust him now to handle our money, to handle our business, because that's just, that's just what I resonate with. And that's what I put out there and that I received that back as well. So. Okay, so do you have two divisions of your business, one with the hair extensions and one with consulting other businesses? Well, I've started a lot more since then. So I've started a hair class as well. Um, oh, and, then, and then with consulting, I basically do strategy calls. Um, but my, my business is centered around helping people while we sell to them. Because if we sell to them and they don't know what to do with the product, they don't understand how to talk about it, then they're not going to do very well. And if they don't do well, then we don't continue. So like it's, it's in our best interest to make sure they have the knowledge and the information and the guidance, which is at the end of the day, the guidance ends up being like me and my knowledge and me being there. Cause I'm, I love being motivated and I love, I, I think, I don't know who said it, but I think it was in Latin or something um, to, to inspire others. You need to be inspired yourself. Mm. Um, I love getting inspired and pulling inspiration because I'm able to help others and inspire them. But my team in the mornings, I try to send them every morning, a YouTube video that I listen to that, that you know touched my heart and say you know good morning I'm grateful for this today I'm grateful for you today um, and I, I love doing that and I do that with my business clients as well and um, you know since then I've started a vacation rental company uh, and bought my first condo and I do the same thing with my renters when they come in like I'm like because the way I brought my condos on my childhood favorite areas in Destin Florida um, so I get to tell them like hey go here to eat go there for the museum go here for nightlife you know like I know exactly where to go and I, I love doing that and like they love it because they're like wow like this is so much nicer than having like some robot on Airbnb, like send us a pre-recorded, you know, text message. And I kind of like really put my hands on with them. All right. You said a lot and, and you talk pretty fast. 
Sorry. So, so we're going to slow this down just a little bit. You said you have to take care of your customers and to help them. Because if you don't, they won't know what to do with the product. They won't be able to use it effectively. And if they don't use it effectively, then they won't be repeat clients. They won't be able to help them with their stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, and I said stuff, which means their business, I think is what you said. Um, and so what you're doing is you are now teaching people how to do the business of hair extensions, if I understand this. Exactly, exactly. And in the um, beginning, I was like 10 times more. Now I have so many clients that it ha like I ha have like a rule. When the people are willing and wanting the information, I give it to them freely. You know, they, if, they're, if the, the person that calls me in the morning, that texts me in the evening, that asks me questions, I'm there to help them. Um, but I can't just do that for everybody because I don't have enough of me to go around for everybody, which is like why like I've been working on the, on the, on the class as well because I actually have a partner working on the class with me because um, all that information, all that knowledge can kind of be put in one place and then people can go watch the videos and get the PDFs and, and look into it and learn from there. Got it. All right. So this whole journey about getting out of jail, whatever jail someone is in, whether it's a jail that is a physical reality, like your, the schools you were in or the prison you were in, or whether it's a jail that is a mindset jail. It is created by belief systems. It's totally invisible to the outside and even on the inside. What you've created to help people is nothing short of amazing. And I am so excited to be giving this as a gift to everyone from you. So thank you so very much. So Katie's going to put this in the chat. Tell me a little bit about this because the title is very intriguing and we're going to create a great subtitle for you. The title is Meditations of a Prisoner. Yeah, um, I can't really kind of bad. So just kind of like, cause like it's my journals, it's like, like what I was writing in prison. Um, but when I started reading them, I didn't. I guess I don't give myself enough credit sometimes because I didn't think at that point in my life I was in any kind of mind state that was, you know, looking for something better and, and stronger in life. And when I read them, I was like, wow, like I did have a lot of this, you know, in me back then. I just wasn't aware of it and I didn't act on any of it. Um, so there's a, a lot of like craziness, a lot of like my old mentality in there. But there's also very like cool, uh, like glimmers of hope and of like, you know, strength in there. And that's why I really want people to see like, you know, that side first. My second book is the entire story, which I'm still writing to from childhood through all the boot camps and schools until, you know, where I am now. And um, I'm still 15 years old in that book. So I have a lot of writing left to do in that book. Um, but Meditation with a Prisoner is, uh, you know, it's a very real raw um, subject matter that, you know, I got someone to transcribe directly from my handwritten journals into digital. And I've had to go forward in the preface and I'm going to do like an outro, um, you know, kind of discussing, you know, the mindset of, of what's moving into the next book um, of how someone goes from like, quote unquote, like a convict to a CEO or from that area of life and that identity to, to where I am now. From convict to CEO. Yeah. Um, and I would just go convict CEO. And, 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 and that's like who you are. And it's very compelling, Rocky, because you have a very gentle way about you. And I so appreciate your being willing to come on the Suicide Prevention Show and to share your story. And the beauty of the sign over your shoulder is it is obvious that that's how you live, that you do what you love. And it's a very different way to live. Definitely. And yet, so incredibly simple. There is nothing conversation. You know, how, um, how there's nothing complicated is what I'm going to say. There's nothing complicated about what you do every day. You just do what you love. Exactly. Whatever's in front of me, whatever feels right. Even in our business, like I, I used to have like a regimented way of like trying to do things every day. And now it's kind of like whatever feels right to work on that day, whatever like the kind of is right in front of me. I just do it and kind of move forward with it. And I love the way you put things as well. Like you, you, you gave me the title for this. Like, I, like there's so many like little nuggets that you drop like that with your wording. It's so amazing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'm the queen of taglines is what what one of my guests on on my podcast uh, said, Jackie, you are just the queen of taglines. And I'm like, oh, I could own that one. Yeah. (laughs) The the beauty, Rocky, of you being willing to share your story is that you gave me so much information that my gift, which is taking massive amounts of information and distilling them down could serve you. And I am so grateful that I was able to give you something back because you have given so much to my audience and to the world and to everyone watching this to go into the meditations of a prisoner and allow them to inspire you to come out of the jails that you might be living in that you're not even aware of. I can't ask for anything more than that, Rocky. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm more than honored. Thank you so, so much. And when your book is ready, I want you to come back. 100%. 100% deal.